Well, good evening. I'm, I'm Dr. Jessup, and um, I'm a cardiologist just down the street, North Cascade Cardiology. And I've been asked to give a talk tonight on peripheral artery disease. And as a heart doctor, um, we deal with arteries all throughout the body. So this is not going to just be on arteries outside of the heart, but we'll talk about arteries inside the heart as well, because that's near and dear to me, and that's what I do a lot of as well. Um, it's a beautiful day. I'm really thankful you guys showed up. We're not going to run until 8 o'clock tonight. Um, right? We're going to have to skip out a little bit early and go play hooky. And, um, but feel free to ask questions. We're in no rush. Um, just a couple of things. We are taping the talk, but we're not taping anyone you know, behind the camera, so don't worry about that. Um, there are some pretty, uh, I didn't realize it when I put it together, but there may be some images in your handouts that are disturbing. Um, and I apologize for that, if that's the case. Um, they're going to be up here too, so be aware of that. And some of the pictures I'm showing may not be able to be seen very well with you folks in the back, so if you want to come up with the pictures, feel free. If you can see them, that's fine too. Um, but we sort of want to talk about peripheral artery disease, and you can't talk to a cardiologist without knowing where we came from. And catheterizations and angiograms uh, when you put small tubes in the body have been going on for years. And in 3000 BC, the Egyptians were the very first ones that took metal pipes and stuck them in bladders and tried to do a catheterization that way. Um, and that's where it all started. And then in 400 BC, um, they were taking hollow reeds um, out of, you know, where, where reeds are, and looking at cadavers inside the heart, putting these reeds inside the heart to try to look and see what the heart valves were doing and how they were moving. Um, in 1711, a ural, um, oh, I'm sorry, this isn't him. In 1711, um, the first cardiac catheterization was performed by a fellow by the name of Hales. He used a brass pipe, a tube, and the trachea of a goose. Um, he had this horse laid down and stuck this catheter directly into its neck. And that's, the, that's how we measure blood pressure back in the old days. Poor <laughs> um, horse. Um, and then Dr. Forsman, um, a urologist of all things, was the man who first did the uh, first cardiac catheterization. He had the design or the idea, but he took a, a, a rubber tube and he was going to place it through a vein in his arm and uh, put into his heart. And his research assistant at that time was a woman, and she goes, doctor, doctor, don't do this to you. You need to do it to me first. And he goes, okay, why don't you lay down? So he laid her down. He goes, this is, going to be a, this is a true story. This is going to be a little bit discomforting, so I'm going to strap you down. So he strapped her down. He gave her ether, knocked her out, and then he turned around and did it to himself. <laughs> and he knew he was in his heart when he felt his heart fluttering really, really fast. And then he ran downstairs to the, to the radiology and he took an x-ray. And this is the cath this is the real x-ray catheter coming up around here. And you can't see it around there, but then it's inside of his heart. And basically, after he had used up every vein he had, putting these catheters in there, he finally had to stop. Unfortunately, he was ostracized by the medical community. He was kicked out of urology. He practiced primary care medicine in rural England, and only after his death was he awarded the Nobel Prize for medicine for his pioneering work. And then along came um, the Nike Shoe Company, and around the same time in the 70s, a fellow down in Oregon was putting together waffle irons and building these shoes out of rubber, the same man in Germany was doing the same thing and building angioplasty balloons with the same waffle and the same rubber, just a different mechanism. And you know, they did the first one, an angioplasty inside of an open beating heart. This was an operating room. And then literally three months later, they did the very first one in 1977. A patient had a blockage right there. This is really hard to see. This black is an artery right through there, and there's a blockage, it's hard to see, hard to see, but there it is right there, and then that's what it looks like after they were done. Um, the man who had this done has never had another angioplasty, and you can go and search him out on YouTube. He gave a talk just you know a couple years ago saying how great he felt. So 
People say balloon angioplasty, just popping the blockage open doesn't work. Well, the first one worked pretty well. So it's a pretty interesting story. Now this is something um, that I happened across. It's a quote from Henry Ford, and it's a quote that I sort of live my life by, and I wanted to share it with you. And as you can't build a reputation on what you're going to do, you have to build on what you've done. And so I'm going to talk to you now about the things that we've done here in town, the procedures we can do, and things that we can learn together to try to keep us, and try to keep you away from someone like me, who makes a living opening up these blocked arteries. The first thing that we should get when we're born is a human user's guide, and we don't get one. And the manual um, is real simple, but a lot of us don't get it. We have to know our numbers. So just like you know when you turn your car on how much gas you got in the tank, you gotta know two things. You need to know your cholesterol, and not your total cholesterol, you need to know your LDL, and this is in your chart. But you need to know your LDL, that's the bad cholesterol. And that number should be on the tip of your tongue. And the other one you need to know is your blood pressure. Because just like any pipe in your house, if you put grease down the drain, you're going to clog that pipe up. And your LDL is the grease that you're putting down your drain. And just like any hose you got hooked up to the hydrant, if you take a hose, a garden hose, and hook it up to a fire hydrant, the blood pressure, the pressure is real high, you're going to damage that hose. And so we need to know our blood pressure and make sure it's normal. Normal is around 120 to 140 on the top number, 70, 80 on the bottom number. Those are numbers we should have. The next thing we need to do is we need to walk. Because believe it or not, humans are made to walk. And you don't have to walk a lot. 30 minutes, three times a week is a good place to start. But we're made to be active. When we walk, we exercise our muscles. Our muscles eat up sugar and that decreases our risk of diabetes. Our muscles eat cholesterol, that lowers our LDL, so there's a lot of beneficial things. And then finally, we don't need to smoke. Smoking is toxic, it's a chemical. My family, we were just talking, Lisa and I, I'm from North Carolina, I just went back last week. My in-laws are tobacco farmers, I see it every day, um, and you just don't, you shouldn't smoke. We all know that, we're not gonna talk about it much. So what happens with this artery disease? How does it progress? What causes it to pro progress? Well, just like a pipe in your house, when you do things like eat fat or increase your bad cholesterol, this, over time, cholesterol begins to form on the inside of a pop, pipe, just like your drain at home. And over time, this blockage gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and just like your drain at home, it eventually clogs up. Now, when it happens at home, you pour some Drano down it, and it opens up, or you call the plumber, and the plumber comes in there and rotor rooters it out. And that's essentially what we do. When it clogs up, you have a heart attack, or you can have a stroke, a heart attack, you can damage your kidneys or damage your legs, and then you call someone like me in, you come to the emergency room, I can give you clot-busting drugs, snake venom type things that are designed to block, the, you know, break these blood clots apart, or we can go in there like the rotor rooter guys and use that balloon and push the blockage out of the way and put a stent in there to keep the blockage out of the way if that's something we need to do. Now, if we look at how many people in the world have these things, or in the United States, um, stroke occurs in about five and a half million people, heart disease in 13 million, and this peripheral disease, these blockages, not inside the heart, but in the neck and the arms and the legs and the kidneys, and about 12 to 18 million. Unfortunately, in 2050, the year 2050, it's going to go up higher. They're saying almost 20 million people in the United States are going to have it. So it's definitely a growing field, unfortunately. And what we don't know will hurt us. And in September 2001, a study came out and it showed that doctors don't do a good job at finding about blocked arteries in the legs and the kidneys and the neck. And it's a problem we have as a profession. We're rushed, we're trying to do other things. Oftentimes, um, we don't ask the right questions. And hopefully, this is where education and what I'm doing tonight can help out, where we can all learn what we need to pay attention for and we can tell our friends and become more informed consumers and learn more about that user's manual that we need to know about. 
Because when we talk about peripheral artery disease, we're all worried about what happened here to CP3O in the first Star Wars, is I'm, am I going to get an amputation if I got a blockage in my leg? And the good news is no. You know, the, the, we, we all know people who've had amputations through our lives. For the most part, people with blockages in leg arteries do not get amputations. It's still a big concern. It weighs heavily on our heart. So when you have people, one of the things that we can have blockages in the legs, the primary problem that's going to cause is problems walking. And it's very hard for doctors, going back to that last talk about how we don't ask the right questions, it's very hard for us to, to ask the right questions. And part of it has to do with where we all come from. We all have our own histories, our own backgrounds. I'm from North Carolina. Words have different meanings back there. There are different expectations in North Carolina than there are in Washington State. We all have our own backgrounds. And what I say pain or does it hurt may be achy or heaviness to somebody else. And sometimes that's hard just to tease out. And we've all had conversations with people where at the end of the conversation we laugh and say, oh, that's what you were saying. I didn't realize it. Um, so in the 21st century, with everybody trying to walk and keep active, some of the things that we can listen for are heaviness in the legs. If you're walking down the street and you notice that your legs are heavy or they hurt or they're achy in the calves and it gets better when you rest and worse when you walk faster worse when you walk up an incline. Much like a car who has a, a blocked fuel line. You know, you're revving the engine on the highway and the car conks out on you, but you're able to idle it in the driveway. Much like that, you're able to walk maybe a little bit or you sit and you feel fine, but when you rev your engine, you try to keep up with the grandkids or keep up with your friends, you're just not able to do it. And being from North Carolina, I just don't have the expect, I mean, when I first moved here, people, People wanted to do more than they would in North Carolina. I had a 79-year-old woman who was in a 60-year-old hiking club and she couldn't keep up with them and she was furious and she had blocked leg arteries. Um, I had a woman who was in a walker and she couldn't keep up with her hiking club as they went around um, Desolation um, um, Pass or, uh, you know. Um, so people have different expectations and we want to do more. We want to keep walking and keep active. One reason we moved to Bellingham, where we live in Bellingham, is to stay out and do more active things. Um, one woman, uh, she's 89 years old, and she takes her boat around the San Juans by herself. And she had a blocked leg artery and couldn't do it. She fixed the leg artery, now she's camping on by herself again. So everyone comes to the table with a different idea of what you want to do.